Oh, he's going, oh my word. Hey, hi. <laughs> number one, I look orange. I'm not quite sure. Number two, I see the StreamYard logo. What's going on, StreamYard, once again? What's happening? I paid. <laughs> Almost 500 rand a month is no joke when you pay for StreamYard on a monthly basis so that you don't see the watermark. And yet I am seeing the watermark. What's going on? I need to send you another email. Come on, people. But anyways, welcome to Vlogmas episode 20. Yep. Today is day 20, five days to go, and then it is all over. Yeah, oh my goodness, I'm going to miss vlog missing. Just like I miss vlog tobing. For some reason, after vlog tobing, I was like, okay. I know it is a lot of work because I was juggling my nine to five, which is very demanding on its own. And then also, I was vlog Hoving. And then once again, we are here uh, with Vlogmas. And when it started, it was still work um, that was still going on until the 16th for me. I was supposed to have ended my year on the 14th, but on the 16th, 15th and 16th, I found myself at the office working like I always do. But uh, my boss has been behaving because he's in Australia. Thank goodness he's gone home. So I don't have to be at the office during holidays. I think on Friday he forgot that it was a public holiday, but he was also leaving on the same day to Australia. Uh, so that was um, my day on Friday. So Monday, quietness. Tuesday, which is today, quietness. And I'm very much happy with that because now that means I can relax and focus on my YouTube channel. So, well, guys, I do have good news, but this good news will have to uh, fall on tomorrow's Vlogmas. Uh, but I'm very excited about this good news. And uh, I believe things now for me will get back to normal. I don't want to talk too much about that difference, but probably you may be seeing it now. I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I think I'm I'm giving away clues. But anyways, guys, how has been your Tuesday? Have you ever woke up on a Tuesday morning because your alarm clock, you, you did not stop it? You, like you did not like, no, don't wake me up during Monday uh, to Friday. My alarm clock went off yesterday and I jumped out of bed and started preparing like I always do. When I was just about to leave the door, I remembered, dude, it's December. It's the holiday. Where are you going exactly? And then today, same thing happened because yesterday I did not switch off my alarm clock. It went off again this morning, and then I jumped out of bed, went to take a shower, prepare myself while I was busy uh, applying lotion, which I don't use lotion, but I use Vaseline. So while I was busy uh, applying Vaseline on me, I was like, <laughs> you better get your butt back in bed because it's the holidays. I've been so excited about that, and I went back to bed. You know, when... You know, or when you're a YouTuber, I don't know if it's me who experiences this, being in front of ring lights and also having to talk for so long, like over an hour. In the morning, when you wake up, your eyes are still heavy. You just want to sleep and your jaws are a little bit tired because you've been talking. So when I realized that I need to go back, get back to bed, I was like, oh. I took the blankets and then I just covered myself and gone. I was asleep up until 10. Imagine my alarm clock rings at quarter to seven. And uh, imagine from about five to seven-ish when, yeah, when I realized that, dude, get back to bed. I slept all the way till about 2.10. And then at 10 o'clock, in, in my area, we get load shedded. So I was like, oh, that's extra two hours. Went back to bed, woke up at 12, 20 or something. Just when I was opening my eyes, lights came back. 
So it was a nice, lazy Tuesday for me. <laughs> I, I'm thinking maybe I should also turn, leave my, oh yeah, you know, turn it back on my alarm clock so that I'll go through the same tomorrow. But I think by tomorrow, I know what, what's up. I think I'm now used to it that we are on a holiday. <laughs> I see y'all already laughing. Let me get to the comment section or to the live chat. I see you got me with Betty K. Hello, family. How are you there? It's so good to see you here. Once again, thank you for being here. Victoria's sisters laughing. I know. It's a holiday. My brain still hasn't computed that it's the holidays, the December holidays. Can you see how orange I look? I got ring lights, if you, as you can see, reflecting. I've got light on as well. But I still look orange. What's happening? <laughs> and then StreamYard has, has not removed the watermark. I see it right there, and yet I paid, guys. What's happening with StreamYard? This is the second time they are doing this to me, and I hate seeing watermarks on my videos. I really, really do. The reason why I'm willing to pay 500 rand a month uh with StreamYard is because i don't want to see that duck is it a duck is it a what what is that a goose what is that cannot be um a flamingo jeez man whatever that bird is i don't want to see it because i've paid StreamYard. if you're listening please my email address is associated with my account that i pay for please just do your thing all right <laughs> and lindy sue She's in the house. Hey, hi, family. Hi to you too in Swaziland. Oh, that country. That country will always be the love of my life. I spent five years of my uh, my very, very young life there because of political violence in my township, which is Hammersdale in KwaZulu Natal. If you know anything about the 19 like mid 1980s black on black violence uh because of politics uh you would know that my township of hammersdale which is also known as mpumalanga township was the hardest hit during that time and so there was like families being targeted my family was one of the people that were targeted to be you know and so intelligence, the ANC intelligence found out about it and told us to get, in fact, they didn't tell us to get out. One evening we were seated at home, probably like, I don't know if we were awaiting for the attack or whatever the case was, but I remember a red van with a, you know, the canopy, but it's not a canopy per se, but you know the one that with the sail? So <laughs> I, I, I cannot believe I can remember this. And I was a Kid, a child when this happened but i do remember us being put under because at that time okay let me just tell the story so without also violating community guidelines i'm going to ask you to use your your mind basically your creativity or your intelligence whichever way you want to see it so <laughs> during that time the you see i don't want to mention political parties but there were two major political parties. Again, you have to use your mind or your our history to know which political parties. I already mentioned one of uh, of it. There's a second one. So they were at war with each other. More, it was like it was more like a turf war. Uh, who's in control of KwaZulu Natal over who's in control of um, the black people, basically. But the other one was more like Zulu based, and it was only for Zulus and Zulus only. And the other one was more like national, anybody and everybody can join that party. So my family happened to join that party, which is the governing party today. Um, and so what we didn't know was that the area that we were living in, in Hammersdale, was that other political party's major, major turf. So the township is divided into sections so we call those sections units that is unit one there's unit two unit three that's where my dad side is unit four which is now my mom's side of the um the township and then there was unit six 
it, the, the setting was quite weird as well because unit one was okay never mind that's not the um, the story so um in unit four it so happened to be filled and that was the base of the that other political party and then the unit three unit six i think unit not unit two unit one unit two they were on the other side of in fact maybe it was a mixture let me just put it that way maybe it was a mixture someone somehow the other party found out that my family whom who my mom my dad my grandparents including uh some uh family members were well uh active in the uh which is not the governing party uh they were very active and they were doing those trenches things i hardly ever saw my dad whenever i saw him it was probably a week my mom was more like the one that uh provided the house for meetings there are a lot of ministers today ministers today some of them i remember that oh i remember you used to come even a former president i remember you coming to my house I, in fact i know i remember two of the presidents former president because one i saw him in swaziland and then he was the next door neighbor to us in swaziland and uh the other one used to come to our house that where they used to hold these meetings so this political party found out that my house was like the meeting spot now my house was also a pretense to be like they would pretend to be like a singing band they would sing songs like i still remember this song it i once sung it on either on instagram or on a short it goes like this Ilanga, Malishona. So they would sing that song and they would sing other songs as well. While they were taking a break, that's when they would have the like a um a, what do you call that? Like a quick, quick, quick meeting and update, and then they would sing again. So anybody that is walking outside would think that this is a band of some sort because they had like guitars, they had, they had, they were just making sure that nobody found out what their meetings were about. So somewhere, somehow, I don't know who they, uh, they, um, they captured and they confessed that actually that house is what, where we meet and we strategize and things of that nature. So then now my family became a target and the governing party uh, party they uh, they got an intel and then they sent this vehicle i think it was a datsun you know those tiny vans so yeah i think yeah it was a datsun i don't know i was still a kid but i was smart enough to know or to see and remember that it was a small bucky that came and it had that stale canopy that basically just closed so inside it, there were like clothes and bags and, and stuff like that. And so they told my older brother and I, because it was still the two of us, they told us to go underneath these, these bags as though we were also like luggage. Because that other political party, what it used to do was it, it hunted young boys. So what they young, once they go into a house with young boys, they would give them to their parents if they refuse to their parents then whoever gave the young boy to shoot to their parents then they would then the parents in front of the kid before the kid that's how cruel uh some of these people were so now because my brother and i we were young so the, the first thing that they did but before they Put us in the car they dressed us up like girls they had like these girl girl clothes and so when you were a kid sometimes one doesn't know whether it's a boy or a girl and stuff like that so they just dressed us up and put us under these um this luggage and so then they covered the sail and then my mom was not in the vehicle because she was the biggest target for these people so i remember as we were driving to um outside of the unit unit four so there was a roadblock mm, there was a roadblock and then they stopped the car they i think they knew the driver who he was but they thought he was part of them when he was actually not 
And so they said, can we search? And indeed they searched. I remember my heart just pounding. It's just pounding. So they just checked like with torches and what, what, because it was in the evening and the sun had just set and they were just checking. They realized, okay, it's just clothes and um, um, luggage and stuff like that. And they told them to go. Now my mom had to walk along a river, a stream. So there was a stream that was running behind the township. I think I've mentioned in my October video that we used to use that stream when I was experimenting with alcohol and smoking and why I don't drink and smoke today because of those experiments. If you remember that story time, yeah, that's the one. So my mom had to walk with a group of her comrades down that stream. And I, I believe they walked the whole night because we met them on the other side because we drove for a very long time. And then I remember stopping for a very long time as well uh waiting indeed my mom came she hopped onto the thingy and then off we went i remember the ride was so long i was hungry and i was half crying and also very confused but eventually i think we got to the border gate that's when they took us out of the um the bag and then my mom had a passport and then we were also uh basically uh that's how we entered swaziland and i remember in swaziland we drove for ever we got to a place called dondon i don't know if um lindy sue knows this place it's not far away from mayflower is it mayflower or mayflower there's another like though i remember being that time it was a forest like a forest of um it's not gum trees maybe pine trees it was just like pine trees everywhere and it was like a sea of pine, uh, pine trees in that area and then we will use the main road that led straight into that village called dondon or dondon i can't remember exactly but i think it's called dondon i don't know what's called today that's where um we left civilization for the first time in my life uh i didn't <laughs> it was not electricity when it was dark outside you couldn't even see your hand in front of you that's how dark it is they cooked on um on fire, you had to go fetch wood, you had to go fetch water, you had to do things that I was not used to. <laughs> I remember waking up the following day um, when I opened my eye, there was this big, huge head that peeped into the window. That was a, a cow's head. And it went like more, did I not jump screaming and crying and I wanted to go back home? <laughs> because I was like, I don't know why we've been abandoned here. So it's something that, uh, yeah, pine trees. Yeah, it, indeed, there were pine trees. Uh, so, <laughs> I tell you, my, my life from coming from a township that was well taken care of, by the way, I must say this, the apartheid government really, really took care of my township. And I'll tell you why. Our roads were all tarred. Every section of my township, every road was tarred. We had like man-made forests as well like there were trees like avenues in my township every second day the garbage truck came to collect we every house had a bin and like you know the bin that is made this of the same material as tires i don't know if you remember those bins we had those bins and then they would come every two days and we used to sing that song which they they didn't like the garbage guys uh we used to say ganda ganda matio I still remember. I still remember. And they would chase us and then they would take our bins and then they, yeah, and then they would take it away. Our streets used to be clean, like swept while we slept during the night. We woke up the streets with clean compared to today. Yeah. It was clean, the safest township you can ever imagine. You can Google it. Google it. You will find that Hamas Day, that's, that's the name of my, I think it's the name of the place, but the township was called Mbomalanga Township. So it used to be beautiful. And I wanted to go home. And I think it was also the first township that was uh, electric, I don't know, is it elect electrified? I think we were the first township to be electrified. All the houses in Hamas Day had electricity. 
Now, it was up to you what you would do with the electricity. My house was the first one to have a television. And our first television, it was a color television. It was not black and white. It was a big color television. That is where I used to watch uh, Knight Rider, uh, MacGyver, <laughs> the A-Team. <laughs> and all the kids in my neighborhood would come and they would watch and they would peep through the windows. My brother saw an opportunity to make money and he would charge them one cent to, <laughs> to watch. But I used to sneak some of my friends in and would sit inside the living room and... Um, and uh, what you call this, and, and watch our programs. So um, yeah, then I was in Swaziland for five five years. I learned the language, the culture. I learned to herd cows. Yeah, then I think it was the most difficult thing I have ever done in my entire life. Going to the bushes, like huge bushes, and then. And that area of Dondon used to have this river, this huge river. Sometimes we had to cross that river so that the cows on the other side, uh, you know when they say it's always green on the other side? It's true because for the cow to eat healthy and be healthy, you had to cross that river. I don't know what that river is called. I, I don't think I ever knew what the name of it. So we had to cross. You know, me, poor me, who never crossed the river in his life was like, now how do we do it? How do we do this? So that this uh, this other guy will say, climb on top of one of the uh, the. Car. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's not going to happen. So eventually, I had to learn how to cross the river. Basically, there was a strategy not to get swept away that you had to walk at, like against the uh, the currency, and uh, you really need to balance yourself and then get to the other side. So eventually I was the one who was enjoying crossing that river. I hated it whenever it rained heavy because the floodplains will get uh, like over flooded or the banks will be, the river banks will basically overflow with water. And then, so we couldn't for like maybe two, three weeks until the water kind of like subsided to the level we can use to cross over. So Swaziland for me was a learning, learning, journey for me there's there are a lot of things that i still use today especially with strategies that i use to this very day because of the things that i learned in swaziland i hope you enjoyed that story <laughs> i know that there's, there's still more stuff uh, about this whole thing but i think this is uh this is as far as i can go uh in in telling the story i don't remember many things so let me go back to the live chat um, then you say Swaziland, Swaziland hosted a lot of South African politicians. Yes, two, one president, one former president who happens to be my favorite, very favorite of mine. I saw him in Swaziland. He was a next door neighbor of ours where, uh, because all the governing party politicians lived in that village. Even if the, that other party was looking for them, they would not have found them because Don Don is like far flung. It's a far flung in Swaziland. If you want to enter Mbabane, you still drive maybe another four or five hours or something like that to get there. So even if they were looking for they would not have found them. Because inside as well, you had to go into like uh, valleys and climb mountains with the, with, the, with the vehicle to get to where you were going to. It was like rural, rural, rural. We would sit in a bonfire with mealies, like frying mealies, and then you would not see behind the other person. <laughs> if you walked away from the fire and you put your hand in front of you, you would not see. That's how pitch dark it was. <laughs> it was fun though. It was fun. Eventually, I, I adapted. My brother found it extremely difficult to adapt um, to that lifestyle. But me, I usually, even to this very day, if something is beyond my control, I quickly accept it. I quickly accept. I've always been like that. If I know that this one I have no control over, what's the point in crying? Who's going to hear you? So just get just, just accept and move and make the best of it as well. Um, activists and their families during struggle day. Yeah, indeed, Swaziland was definitely the hideout. 
Oh, red grade eight. Hey, Rodney, how are you doing, bro? It's so good to see you here. <laughs> how are you doing, man? How are you doing? I keep watching that letter uh, from an African to to an, to, to the American uh, to the African American. Yeah, it still brings tears. When I saw it the first time, I was like, "Whoa, this person is speaking exactly what some of us have been saying to ourselves." But the thing is, if you do say it out loud, to whom are you saying it, and who is going to listen to that? Because you are different. You, the Morrisons, the Assads, and all the other African Americans who are like, hey, Africa is where we ought to be or should have been for a very long time uh, are the ones that are more open-minded. Some, you say something, they'll be like, hey, bro, I'm not an African and I am an American. So that letter said so many things that we some of us have been thinking um, and also saying, even in, amongst each other as South Africans or Africans, like, hey, dude, this is how I feel. I feel like sometimes that guilt she talked about is real. Like, I know for us it's irrelevant here in South Africa because slave, slave trade did not touch us, even though they got here. And when they got here, they were like, nah, these guys are too short with big bellies. They're lazy. There's no way we can take any of them. So that's how we survived that. But um, I'm laughing at the fact that they say we're short, big belly, and lazy, not other stuff. But so that's how we did not. But still, it does not remove the fact that there is African in your identity as a black person in America. So when to say it's African, I'm involved too. So that guilt, I know it like. How do we bridge the gap? And then I am so happy that people like yourself and the Assads and the Morrisons and um, everyone else that is coming down here. Right now, the Williams, that is Paul and uh, Denise Williams, young um, African-American couple, they're also making their way to South Africa. They are moving. So I'm following their journey as well. I think they're quite close to... Who uh, are getting to stay? I'm not quite sure. I think it's it's a three-year visa or something like that, and they are busy working on it. Those are the things that I, that makes me feel relieved. They're like, okay, surely this conversation is going to take place when we're sitting in a dinner table and say, hey, you know, once we this is how we used to feel. This is how we used to feel. And that I think I even made a video, if it's not a short, where I was asking the question like, who told African Americans that Africans hate them? And then it hit me that propaganda, the people who come, I'm sure Rodney, uh, Red's great eight, guys, please do, do subscribe to his YouTube channel. He's been here twice already and he's moving to South Africa. Please do subscribe to his channel. And he's currently, he is dropping videos about his latest trip with the real South Africa when they were doing the house tour. Uh, beautiful videos, incredible stuff, wonderful man as well. Very, I love Rodney so very much because he is the, the bro bro, you know, the bro that, that he's a brother, like not only a person that is fascinated and, and, and uh, he is a bro bro. Guys, please do subscribe to his channel. So things like that, I'm very much happy it kind of consoles my heart as well to think that, hey, finally we will be able to connect, build relations, and um, and advance um, this continent to levels that these people that keep telling you that Africans hate, hate you when we don't, they are the same people when you are flying from the US coming here, it's only them in the flight. I have seen it to myself too. Uh, a couple of times, like you're flying, that's when uh, SIA used to fly to uh, from New York uh, to, is it, no, Washington, sorry, from Washington to uh, Johannesburg. And you're like, why am I the only black person in here? <laughs> and everyone else, as uh, Stace calls them, okay, let me not say it, <laughs> let me not say it. And you're like, okay, one chocolate chip cookie in the 
whole of this it, it was very very strange for me but you who do you say this to it was quite difficult to express yourself now that you guys are filling up these planes thank goodness thank goodness i thank the real south africa the blantons i thank the assads i thank the morrisons i thank everybody that has made their way and creating youtube videos and showcasing our continent that it is not what national geographics has been telling you and i know somebody was saying i think it was denise williams was talking about oh no it was not her but there was someone else i was oh it was a video by that was dropped by uh, dr assad uh mid-morning today and he had this dude who has been coming to south i think this is the third time and this he was talking about how africa has been portrayed i even remember somewhere in america whenever a child does not finish their food the parent will be like eat your food finish your food do you know how many kids are starving in africa i come to africa and see how many kids that are starving right but anyways that is what national geographic has been um uh, propagating and now our own brothers and sisters they feel and think that we are a no-go area for them which is very sad now that you guys are coming and you're creating videos and i do see the reactions from others are like what no this is not what we were told where are the flies where are the hearts where is children starving i'm not saying they are not poor people in Africa because they are and there are indeed some kids who are starving but there's aid there is uh governments that are doing the best that they can to provide for their people but there is a, even a great story on the other side there's always two sides to a story and they don't always show the negative one and never show the positive things that we Africans are doing but anyway um, that's one of the things that uh, when I saw a, a Red's great age, all of that just came flooding. He's an amazing guy. Please, guys, subscribe to his channel. All right? You will enjoy him. You will enjoy him. Like I said, he's a bro, bro. A bro, bro. Like, just how he's saying, what's up, bro, bro? What's up to you? <laughs> Incredible. Um, Cecilia is in the house. Hello, people. I'm late. What have I missed? Uh, you missed the story time. I do. I think you already you were already here when I started it. But anyways, it was not long. I've started the the the, the live uh, when you came through. Victoria's sisters. Oh, we have the same family history. I slept in South Africa and woke up in Swaziland. How? <laughs> my brother. My brother has no memory <laughs> because. He was asleep when we were taking that night and he woke up under a pile. My brother woke up under a pile of luggage. Like, what? And then when he got out, he was like in the middle of nowhere. And the border gate, uh, which is, I think it's an Opongolo, that Opongolo side of KwaZulu Natal was not how it looks today. It was like a one little house, tiny little house, where the soldiers would come and then they'll, they'll look at your ticket stamp in and tell you to go in. But I think they let us in because uh, my parents and the people that we were with, uh, I don't know what was the agreement between them and the, and the Swati uh, kingdom to let us in sometimes without passports back then. So <laughs> He woke up. <laughs> that is so hilarious. The reason why I'm laughing is because you remind me so much of my brother because when he was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I hope I'm not going to take too long laughing because I love for a very long time. <laughs> Victoria says, why did you do this to me? <laughs> It was the pine trees, guys. It was the pine trees. It was like a sea. I've never seen so many trees before. Uh, we used to go into that forest as well to fetch wood, and it would be dark inside. The, the sun would be bright and, 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 and it all out. 
but you go into the forest in pitch black. Like, it's scary, but I got used to it. I got so used to it. Uh, fetching firewood there. Uh, and there were also other creatures that other people would go hunt uh, in there. I could have sworn one time I saw a lion. And one thing I learned about and when you see a lion, don't look it in the eye. Because when you do, that means you are challenging it or you are threatening it and it will have to fight you back. But if you take your eyes away from, I'm not quite sure if it's, it's, it's something I remember or it's something that it was, it's in my head. But it feels so real that I did see one. And then I quickly looked away. And I was alone uh, fetching uh, firewood. So, so yeah. Um, I hope it's a it's an hallucination. It's not real. I don't know because if it's real right now, I'll be like, why am I here? <laughs> because I would have looked it directly in the eye and say, lion, get away from me, and I would run. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe it's in my head that one. <laughs> uh, Rhino Games, yo, what's up? Hey, what's up? Hey, I saw your shorts. <laughs> that short was so relatable. It's only like you you open a YouTube channel and you're like. So where are the subscribers? Where are the views? <laughs> where are y'all? <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> Pindi Shobe, hell, hello everybody. <laughs> you know you were saying hello. <laughs> yeah, you must also uh, please do subscribe to Rhino Games. But even though his channel is a gaming channel, but he's also thinking of pivoting. I'm not sure to what. Uh, he's going to pivot. If you are into gaming, please do subscribe there as well. Uh, Pindi, to you too. <laughs> oh, you telling Cecilia that. Okay. Hey, changing the narrative. I was just speaking about y'all. How are you, my booty and my sissy? Oh, you guys, I love y'all. I love y'all way too much. <laughs> and your videos. <laughs> Did I not laugh like a madman this morning? <laughs> Red, Red, why did you keep uh, stays all hanging? <laughs> and then at the end, he got you. <laughs> the way I love you two are just the best, I promise you. <laughs> I love watching y'all all the time. Just load shedding. Oh, load shedding. I missed your live on Sunday because while you guys were live, I was load shedded. And I hated that because I I had the, the notification. I said, remind me. Or is it remind me? What what does it read? I think something like that. <laughs> and and yeah, it was load shedding. I was so mad. I was so, so mad. I hate load shedding, guys, if you know anything. <laughs> Stays I see here in that comment. <laughs> Let me read you, Vaughn. Hi, Yvonne. Hello, friend. Merry Christmas in advance and to everyone in the house. Merry Christmas to you too, Yvonne. Keep cooking those chickens that you throw. Ah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your talent with us. I think I've been following you now for, is it two years? A year and a half, I think. And believe you me, I do watch all your cooking uh, videos because I enjoy cooking channels. I don't know if I've told you guys this. My number one love on YouTube is cooking channels. My second love on YouTube is uh, commentary channels. And I'm not talking entertainment. I'm talking where people dive like intellectually, talk about intellectual things that matter. Those channels, I love them. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can check out um, uh, Kadisha Mbo, Mboe. You can check out T Noor. You can check out who else that you can check? The Foreigner or something. I think he calls himself the Foreign or Foreigner. That is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I enjoy that sort of content so very much. I The third uh, content that I watch on YouTube is vlogs. Uh, funny enough, I do watch vlogs. Uh, I like watching vlogs, and the new people that are coming through that are vlogging, love them, love them. Changing the narrative, he says, there are people wanting to keep us out of Africa. <laughs> yeah. Those people. <laughs> 
I remember you when you were at the airport coming to South Africa when you did that live and you're like it's it's full of people by people stay with your America I'm going to Africa you got drama stays you got drama <laughs> and I love it I'm all for it <laughs> Uh, what's load shedding? Load shedding it is where the government switch lights off for two hours. This time they've gone to four hours. So South Africa is progressing and the population is also growing. So as the population grows, the uh, power stations cannot handle the, the pressure of the um, electricity demand. So now what the government will do in order to have to have generators uh, providing electricity is to switch off a portion of the country while another portion of the country would have electricity for maybe eight hours or even sometimes 12 hours. And it, it rotates like that, like that, like that. So now when it does that, it's so frustrating because they do also tell us in advance, they give us schedules, what time to what time our area is going to be switched off. So the reason why it's called load shedding is because the load of people uh, that are in demand of electricity need to be shed. So basically, they, they're cutting down on the demand of electricity. And so it rotates like this. So it used to be two hours now. And oh, yeah, there are levels. There's level one, or we call it stage one, stage two, stage three, up to stage six. So with each stage, then it gets more intense. So uh, stage one, it is probably you get switched off once a day uh, for two hours. Stage two, it's almost the same as stage one. Stage three, that's when it gets a little bit more uh, intense. They will switch twice a day uh, for two hours. And then the rest of the 24 hours, you have lights. Stage four is also twice a day. From five, six, then they switch off three times. Now it's stage six is basically four hours of load shedding. Right now, we've been dropped down to stage five of load shedding, which is still frustrating, by the way. That's what load shedding means. <laughs> uh, Rhino Game says, man, what if you forget to charge your phone? You have to, uh, you will learn to charge everything, including power banks. Now people are buying inverters, something that I'm also uh, going to be investing in so that I don't run out of Wi-Fi as well as power. So many people now are gravitating towards that, um, which is going to be interesting once we are back online permanently, what the government is going to do, because the government for a very long time did not want us to have independent supply of power. They did not allow us to, um, to have our own um, power supply. Yeah. And so recently, they only allowed us to generate our own, I think it's 100 megabytes. No, not megabytes, kilowatt. OK, what is the electricity uh, thingy? Yeah, I think it's megawatts, only 100 uh, that we are allowed to generate for ourselves. So after everything has been fixed, I don't know what's going to happen. A vault, <laughs> yes, indeed, 100 volts. Is it vault? No, they call it something else. There's something else that they called it. But yeah, the vault is the measurement for electricity, right? So yeah. Anyways, that is that. <clears throat> um, Victoria's sister says, we used to uh, we used to it now. We make plan. Yeah, we we have to make a plan. If you cook with electricity, cook earlier. Check the schedule when you're going to be low shedded, and once you know what what time you're going to be, what time to what time, cook your food. Right now, many people are now buying uh, gas stoves. We call it gas. I don't know what what you guys call. Uh, what what is gas again in American? Because <laughs> I think I'm going to benchmark most of things with American language or English. So we use gas. <clears throat> That's what we are using, uh, some of us, so that even if the lights do go out and uh, it caught me outside, um, I still have gas to cook my meals. 
uh, warm up my bath water and things like that. Yeah, gas stove. Yeah, we use gas stove. Some of us. Some people still haven't woken up to that, that you need to buy a gas stove. And uh, they, they sit it out until the, the, the electricity is back. I've changed a gas stove and have a generator. Oh, it's the noise that I cannot stand with a generator. And I think as well, generators are not South African. It's, it's, generators are so not South African at all. Um, I hardly ever go uh, to a township or somewhere where there's uh, South African, you hear a generator. The only generators I've heard and seen is like these big, big companies, but now they no longer have those loud generators. I think now they've installed inverters. They're very, very quiet. Um, then you will go to these stores in the small CBDs and then you will see uh, most of like Pakistani, Nigerian shops and they will have like generators just screaming away and that will just whoa, me. Like it will just finish me. Because I cannot stand the noise anyway while I'm walking down the street and along those shops. So no, no, generators, I don't think it's our thing. That is why people would rather sit it out until the electricity is back or they will buy inverters, the, the quiet inverters. Uh, Betty Kay says, we cook outside with wood sometimes. <laughs> well, I live in an apartment building. I they won't allow me to do that, but I love food that is cooked from fire. It's got a different taste. I don't know if it's me, but food that is cooked on fire and the smoke as well getting into the food. Mm, my goodness gracious, it reminds me of Swazi. And <laughs> I think that's where I fell in love with food cooked on fire. You know, I had to learn, even though I don't know how to strike a match. But I had to learn how to to put together a, a bowler. Is it a bowler? I think what yeah, they used to um, operate with coal. Uh, there used to be a donkey that would um, that would uh, pass our streets and then we'll come out with buckets or with dishes or some sort, and then we buy uh, these coals and then go into the house. Either the house would have like a uh, a coal stove, or they would cook on a bowler, in baula, basically. And um, <laughs> I learned how to assemble the coals in such a way that um, the fire would not take too long, and the smoke as well, because some coal would give off like this thick, thick smoke. There was a time where my eyes, you see the, the, the white around my pupil used to be a red, 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 because I used to burn those coal or the coal stove as well people are lived i lived don't take me for like what this is like a, a yes yeah fine i sleep on a coconut but this coconut also yeah he got it <laughs> hey can tv how are you doing jobless it's so good to see you on my live, how is Port Accord, Nigeria? You are still in Port Accord, right? Um, it's good to see you here. Thank you for being here so very much. Betty Kay says, I told you, you must move to the north. <laughs> the north for me is like posh, posh. And to think that you now you are able to burn fire and cook in the north, mm, that scares me. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm such a typical Joe Burger. <laughs> you think that the North is like heaven and earth. That's where the rich and famous live. And if you live in the North, it's like mm, money, 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 Range Rovers, and Lamborghinis, you name it everywhere. <laughs> These people don't come to our side of town because we live on the other side of the tracks. <laughs> You, you see, it's a typical small mind, Joburg mind. Like, why would you see other people to be more important than you? Because you can also go to the north, you know? I think many people have discovered that I have been praising these guys for something that I can also do. <laughs> yeah, that's that. Um, why are you laughing, jobless? 
TM. TM, what's your full name? My goodness, I don't think I've never I've ever seen you here. Uh, okay, I'm, 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 please forgive me if you have. <laughs> please, I beg. Uh, I also use fire sometimes as well. Yes, um, I would love to use fire. I love food cooked on fire. It, there's something about it, especially meat, like chicken, especially beef. It's like the smoke gets into the beef and oh, it's beautiful. I love it. I love it. I can't use fire. <laughs> you can't use yeah, fire. Um, I think you really need to build a relationship with fire. That's one thing I, I learned. Um, again, I'm going to make reference of Swaziland because that's where most of these thing, uh, things I experienced, like cooking on fire and stuff like that. I think you have to build some kind of a relationship with fire in order for you to understand it and for it as well to do as you, um, you command. Victoria's sister says, my granddad used to sell coal on springs before we re relocated to Swaziland. So when we came back from Swaziland, the first place that we came back to was Joburg, like Soweto. Soweto is not what it used to be. When you entered, as you were entering Soweto from uh, just before Southgate, there was that Soweto was covered in a thick smoke smelled of coal you know i miss that smell that smell people i miss that smell it's no longer there in the soweto skyline is clear but back then it used to be just covered all over soweto and there'll be these donkeys and horses that will be pu pulling a cart with coal and we would buy again it, it reminded me so much of swaziland and now soweto is nothing what it used to look like back then it is like so well developed it's so clean the air is no long and sometimes whenever i go to soweto i always take a like a because i'm th i'm looking for evidence that oh my god because that to me i love that i used to love that but of course we we are all now have electricity in our homes um our streets are all tarred we used to play in the dusty streets in Soweto. I lived in Mzimshope. I lived in Orlando. Is it? Where is it? Okay, I can't remember. Mzimshope is in the east, isn't it? Oh, no, in the west. I think it was east. We stayed at, we stayed um, in right at the end of the, um, the tracks where the, the trains, we used to say the trains sleep. The, my uh, uncle's house was right there, and we used to go and through the fence and go and go into the trains, and you know, we'll sit there the, most of the afternoons when the trains start pulling in. That's where I lived as well. Where else in Soweto did I stay? Yeah, I think those are the three places in Soweto, and everywhere you went there, it's just this smoke smoke <laughs> and i i enjoyed it i i don't know i enjoyed it um yeah and the first time i experienced tear gas was in soweto and i never want to experience that thing again um betty k says we have land <laughs> yeah the north have land he did <laughs> bobsy hi bobsy thank you for coming in generators are definitely not for south africans no that, that's not our thing it's not it's just like kidnapping is not our crime if you ever hear this kidnapping in south africa you must know it's not done by south africans because that's not our crime <laughs> we know us what what is ours and what is not us. <laughs> uh my neighbor had that noisy generator he only used it a few times and got rid of it because i think he got sick and tired of the noise and probably was the only one who was making noise for the entire neighborhood the noise was just too much. Yeah, I, I yeah, I hate it. I hate it as well. I think it would drive me totally insane. I think I'll even activate a uh, noise pollution law, which some people don't know exists. Yes, if your neighbor is making noise and you have asked him or her at least three times to turn down the noise and they don't, you can call the police. They would spend the night um, in the cell. And of course, be ready that you're going to have an enemy of a neighbor after that <laughs> so sometimes you yeah i think i would have done that i would have like just activated noise pollution and, and they're making noise. yes i know the load shedding but 
you're the only one who's making noise for us. <laughs> Let's compromise. Hi, Nadi Salim is in the house. How are you doing, friend? Hi, it started 15 minutes ago. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> well, these lives these days, they get a little bit longer. Let's see how long this one can go. Uh, so I would say you're not late, but you're late kind of thing, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Uh, hi, host and chat. Hi, how are you? TM says Tembisa. Yeah, I think Tembisa on most South African townships. Like I said, even in, in Guamashu in, in Durban and Umlazi in Durban, I don't remember them. Maybe they use coal. I don't know. But in Hamasde, like I said, that township from the time it was built, um, it, it had hard roads and it also had electricity. So the first time I saw coal in my life, was when I went to uh, Swaziland and Soweto. That was the first time I saw what you would call a coal stove and 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 cooking on fire. The only time I if we, we cooked on fire was when we're doing a traditional do. You know, when you slaughter a goat and, and, and a sheep and cows, you of course you cook them outside in a fire. So that was the only time I would see fire. Other than that, no, I never saw it until Swaziland and um, and Soweto. Uh, Victoria's sister says, uh, then your, our parents must know each other. We relocated to, oh, I know Pefeni. I know Pefeni, Piri, and Rockville. Yeah, I know those places because we used to actually go there as well as kids because we'll have other kids coming from uh, Pefeni, um, Midlands and um, where else as well? Uh, Dobsonville as well. Dobsonville. We would, I don't, ooh, we used to walk y'all. And in the, you, I don't know if that river, I think it's still there. It's it's not a river as well. It's like a sewage river kind of thing. <laughs> but it's, it doesn't have like raw sewage. But I don't know what that stream was. We used to. We used to play there. Remember Orlando Stadium? <laughs> oh my God, Orlando Stadium had those iron uh, amphitheater, not what we have today. Oh my gosh. And my house, my, where we lived, was our house, and in the back was that stadium. Right at the back of it, that was that stadium. <laughs> so whenever Kezo Chiefs and Orlando Pirates played there, and remember there used to be violence after the game. <laughs> It just kind of comes from far away people. <laughs> and I can't believe that I experienced all of <laughs> I experienced all of that. So whenever Kesa Cheese and Barrett played, my mom would say, everybody in the house. <laughs> Nobody outside. <laughs> Soccer comes from far away in South Africa, people. Far away. There are bodies underground because of soccer. And that is why it's not my favorite spot. I don't watch it. It's not my favorite at all because of the experiences and what I think has contributed in changing so many people's lives in the negative way. So I disassociated myself with soccer because of my experiences. Like I said, Orlando Stadium was just behind our house in Orlando. And now that it's got this amazing stadium. It's like, wow. And then the Orlando uh, uh, train station as well. That's where we would play as well, like cross the, um, the rails into Orlando. I'm just trying to think which one is east, which one is west, into Mzumtlope. And then Mzumtlope, I'm Zoom, okay? So the hostel, <laughs> whenever, and I think that hostel was also terrorizing um that area as well so whenever we would play outside the kids would say nah, Zulu, and then everybody would run like like in a split second the streets are empty <laughs> because people are afraid of the zulus See, i told you people are lived <laughs> and imagine when they say here are the zulus and you are like okay i'm zulu what do i do like, do i run as and then you run because you don't want them to know you Zulu. <laughs> oh, 
go in South Africa. Ah, in South Africa, we come from far away, and there used to be areas as well where you were not allowed to dress in a certain color or certain way or walk in a certain way. If you are caught walking or dressed in a certain way, you probably would not uh, come home alive. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we come from far away as South Africans. And I don't hear people talking about this history, uh, maybe because it's too painful sometimes to talk about it, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm talking about, I do talk about it sometimes with, uh, I used to speak about it with my mom when she was alive. I do remember then she always gets surprised, like, how do you remember all these things? I'm like, I'm curious. I was a curious kid. You know, I paid attention to detail. That is what I can still remember to this very day. I still can. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was um, my little, I, I'm sure probably our parents knew each other, I'm sure, I'm sure of it, because if we had similar, probably you and I even met in Swaziland and we didn't know each other, who knows, I don't know if you know, uh, don't, don't, but now I don't see Lindy Sue, Lindy Sue, because that's the, that, that, I don't know, maybe I'm just dreaming the name, I don't know, but I, I know Mayflower, Mayflower was on the other side of the i think it was like an area for white people who had like these factories and businesses i think timber business uh because of um the pine trees so i'm not quite sure probably we did i don't know um i don't know i don't remember the schools that i studied out at uh in swaziland it turned out when i came back to south africa those what i learned there was pretty much what they said useless. And so I had to go back in grades, eventually getting into an Indian school in Durban. Uh, and they also took me back to, to a grade. But um, eventually, I, as I was learning how to speak English and also learning things, I quickly caught things up and then I was promoted. I would be promoted to two classes ahead can you imagine? I'll be promoted two classes ahead. So by the time I matriculated, I was of the perfect age to matriculate at 17. When in fact, I should have matriculated at 23. Because that's how many times I'll be taken back. I would be taken back. But because I would be, uh, I would skip, I'll be skipped classes. They'll be like, oh, this class will not suit him. The first every time um, they I would be skipped a class, they would first start me at remedial school to see if in remedial school I would catch what is going to be learned in the main class. And in a remedial school, within two days, three days, then I, I would then be taken to mainstream, and then they would, I would be capped. Uh, they would watch me closely, and then when I get there, remember back in the day, uh, our report cards we would say number one, number two, number three. <laughs> instead of A, B, C, or whatever the rate used to be. I think today it's either seven, seven is the highest or the best performer one, I think in today's uh, method. So I would write exams and then my name would be the first one that is called, that means from the highest to the lowest. And it, it always ticked off some kids and I would also get like this unnecessary competition. Everybody wants to compete with me because I don't know, maybe because or whatever the case was. And uh, I also got a boy that really, really hated my guts because he would be like number 12 or number 14 um, whenever the reports came and I'll be number one. Sometimes there'll be two number ones. That was me. <laughs> so um, even my high school, I didn't pay for my high school. Throughout my high school, I didn't pay a cent. It was all scholarships. I got to the best boys' school in uh, Johannesburg, or probably even in South Africa, all because of, you know, <laughs> that's a little story about me. <laughs> that is Lemula. You're younger. I'm quite young. Yeah, I'm quite young. I'm on the fourth floor, people. <laughs> As of the 14th of July, 
in case you didn't know my birthday is on the 14th of july <laughs> god's gift yeah uh, um i would say partially true i uh, i still believe that intelligence is an accumulation of um curiosity if you are curious you always d dive in and learn and make mistakes and get burnt and then you know better <laughs> that that's that's how i see intelligence um yes but there will also be the god part to creating you to be a curious person um so yeah i utilize my curiosity yes there are a lot of things where i'll be like definitely curiosity killed that cat because i almost died <laughs> that's my experience with uh, my intellectual development um i ask questions even uh, I don't believe a question is stupid unless you really ask a stupid question, then it will beget a stupid answer. So uh, I don't believe if, if somebody asks me a question, the first thing that I check is, is this question genuine, meaning like the purpose is to learn or you're just being stupid? Um, if I quickly determine that this is a question because you are curious, then I will explain things and hopefully you would get, you, know, you would also have like follow up questions and uh, and things like that. Then we have some kind of a conversation or a debate, a discussion, a, dis a discussion of some sort. So that is how I see intelligence. It's an accumulation of knowledge out of curiosity. You were younger. That's why he was upset at you. Yeah, and I think maybe not because I was young. I think it's because of my um because his parents as well used to be like big contributors um to the school's coffers so i remember at some point the, t the one of the parents the mother came to the school and said why this black kid is number one or something like that and they were like listen uh this is a new south africa. back in the day we used to speak of new south africa they're like this is the new south africa we don't talk like that no more <laughs> So um, I think she pulled the boy out of the school uh, simply because she could not stand the fact that I, this kid, is beating all these English-speaking uh, kids in the class. Um, same goes in, in matric. I couldn't understand because our school was a British royal school. And the majority of, not the majority per se, but a lot of the students or pupils there, they were English speakers. And it always mind boggled me why I was performing better than them when it came to English. <laughs> so like English is difficult. I'm like, you sucked it out of your mother's thingy. Me, I sucked Zulu out of my mama. What are you talking about? <laughs> it always mind boggles me like all the time. That is where also I learned that when you speak English, don't be bombastic. Try not to sound fancy and uh, simplistic goes a long way when you speak English. It gets you into places when people can understand what you are saying rather than when you are confusing people with words simply because you know what these words mean. Uh, they're quite annoying and I also find them quite narcissistic of the person. And if you are that person, stop it. Just be simple. <laughs> Speak as though the man on the street can hear and understand what you are saying. That's my belief. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think I have spoken enough. Is there anything else that you would like us to talk about, guys? Um, I see the numbers grows, grows. And um, also kind of like, that. please, guys, do not leave this live without clicking the like button i explained this yesterday that when you do that with a live uh, and you are liking the live the the replay becomes a video on demand and that's what youtube algorithm looks for that if the live does not uh, pick up and gets likes then it kind of like dies um on the platform and it gets shipped shipped right to the back until the video becomes or the the replay becomes a um a, a video on demand so please do like the live i would highly appreciate that and leave a comment and yes indeed leave also a comment either hey 
I was watching or I'm watching or I'm enjoying the or whatever the case might be, just leave a comment because that matrix as well is engagement and it's very important to the algorithm uh, to convert my video into a video on demand. Rhino Game says, I see you use StreamYard. Is it better than uh, apps in streaming? Yes, it is. And I do not know why I have the watermark because I paid not to see the watermark. And I'm going to write an email immediately after this live is over and ask them, hey, what's happening? This is the second time they've done this. The next time I was live, the watermark was gone. Uh, and they did not even answer me why the watermark was on my life and I see it again and yet it's paid. What's happening? What's happening, StreamYard? If you are listening, uh, associate my 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 email is associated with your account and it's paid. Please, I don't want to see this next time. Uh Nadi Slim says and leave a comment. Yeah, please do leave a comment as well. I will highly, highly, highly appreciate that. I think, guys, I can safely say we have had a great time. Thank you for listening to my story time of where I come from, really, uh, in life. I will highly appreciate uh, that comment. <laughs> if you've been through something like that as well, please say, hey, I also have a similar uh, story to tell about my day back in the day, <laughs> or whatever the case is. Uh, let me say good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I highly appreciate you being here. I love you all so very much. I really do. Thank you for being here. We'll chat some other time, probably next Saturday, because Saturday, Tuesday, I go live. Mwah. <laughs> oh, by the way, <laughs> I can now do this. Whatever. <laughs>